before 1941, if we thought of the Pacific Islands at all, it was as atolls of waving palms, of exotic flowers that bloomed the year round in tropical splendor, quaint and colorful, in it and romance. Here in a vast expanse of square miles of blue sea are the ends of World War II, tiny dots of green in the watery wastes. Not so far from our west coast are the Hawaiian Islands and famous Pearl Harbor. was Pearl Harbor on Sunday, December 7th. This was Pearl Harbor in World War II. Work to be done, a war to be won. Much to do, engineers, welders, crane operators, a ship to repair. This was Hawaii at war. And this too was the islands in wartime, when the jitterbug met up with the hula hula, when fighting men wore garlands of fragrant and fragile tropical flowers around their necks, when they went swimming on the beach at Waikiki, the last place to have fun on the way out, or the first place on the way back. is redolent with the sweet scent of many blossoms. Life can seem one long, lazy afternoon. Here amid so much beauty, it is difficult to think about the destruction of war. But the marks of war remain. Here one sees now a building pitted with bullets a tree through which ripped an enemy shell, a tablet honoring the 900 men who went down with the USS Arizona. Hickam Field, once the target for enemy bombers, rebuilt and in full operation. The first year of the war, Guadalcanal attacked, Battle of New Guinea, the South Pacific jungle, thick and damp and stinking. The first enemy was the jungle, dust, blinding, choking dust, water, foul jungle water, and more mud. Deep in the jungle, a tangle of strangling vines and whispering leaves, you could feel the enemy all about you. They were everywhere, behind a million trees, even up in the trees and under the roots. came thousands of fresh replacements. The men have marched away. 
and today the jungle is creeping back to regain its lost domain. Slowly, the persistent lianas are reaching out their waving tendrils to obliterate the wreckage of war. Tenderly, the soft flowers wreathe a wheel. Slowly and surely, the vines take over, covering the rusty relics that commemorate the skill and ingenuity of our people, now trampled into this havoc by war, most terrible of the four horsemen. Offshore, beyond the reach of the vines and their leafy green camouflage, are enemy ships jutting out of the lagoons, gaunt monuments to grim battles. Most of them are now anchored by the shifting sands, but some that were beached have converted into homes by the islanders, wash instead of signal flags. Yes, life goes on, reviving the old customs and the old tale handed down from the patriarchs to the youngsters. Once more there is the rhythmic pound of feet to the rhythmic beat of drums. Now that the Gilberts were ours, we were ready to move north and strike again the next step toward the enemy homeland. Kwajalein in the Marshalls was the target, and now we have Guadalcanal was a holding action. We had the men and the equipment at Tarawa and Makin, and we attained our objectives. Now we were learning a pattern. Bomb and strafe every hour, day after day, then came D-Day, and we invaded the island. The carriers moved in, and the cruisers moved in. Then the battle wagons spoke in their thunderous voice. The island seemed to rock under the impact of a devastating bombardment. By one, the enemy installations were knocked out. Now he was softened up. Now it was time for the foot soldier to go ashore. This was it. So another battle is won, and our arms are that much nearer the final victory. And when it's all over, the American soldier looks around him for a souvenir of the occasion, such as a motorcycle or one of those flashing swords. Nothing like a fine sword, unless it's a group picture in front of a captured flag. But now there's a different kind of work to be done. The battle's over, but the war is still going on. And that means supplies and trucks to transport them. Treasures of materiel for the next offensive, the next step three. There's just about everything. Bullets and bandages, powdered eggs and beans, tools and machines, drums of gasoline for the trucks and the tanks and the bulldozers because we're building an air base here. Who would have imagined that one bright day we'd be building a landing field at a place called Kwajalein? Where did they get those funny names? Asked the men from Kalamazoo and Passaic.
from Albuquerque, Hamtramck, and Waukegan. Today, the Kwajalein base, unlike most temporary bases that were hastily fabricated in the war, is still in operation as a main stopover point between Japan and the Philippines and the Hawaiian Islands. It is also an important center of the Trust Territory, consisting of the Marshalls, the Marianas, and the Carolines, and under the trusteeship of the United States by action of the United Nations. American administration of the district has brought many changes. The headquarters building is a new and modern structure, and so is Recreation Row, considerable improvement the veteran would find over the chaplain's tent he knew. Still in use is the concrete dock that was built by the Japanese. And here and there is the inevitable wreckage of war, planes and ships that played their part in the struggle and now are still. an enemy gun that was silenced long ago, and there an enemy pillbox festooned with vines. More significant is a tablet on Wolf's strong point to record the fact that here we first landed on Kwajalein and took the island. War's aftermath has brought a new industry. The Marshallese are repairing wrecked Navy launches and converting them into sailboats for inter-island trade with their neighbors. By the middle of 1944, we were well on our way. Now we're about to invade Guam, more than a thousand miles to the west. And here again was the same familiar pattern of island hopping in the The amphibs streaking for the beach. Fiends have landed. For we had learned our lesson well. The invasion... Yes, the pattern was the same, but there was something different about this operation. You see, Guam had been a possession of the United States before the war. It was our job to get it back. While the battle continued on the other side of the island, supplies were unloaded on the beachhead we had taken. Things were moving fast in 44, and particularly here on Guam, for it had been a major military base before the war, and it was to be one again. Buildings that we had shattered and bombed out were hastily demolished and new ones went up in their place. We were building on a recaptured piece of America floating way out here in the Pacific. Meanwhile, until the war was over, Guam was a repair base, the biggest in the battle zone, and near enough to the front to eliminate delays in getting those airplane, trucks, and tank engines tuned up for another sortie against the enemy. Here, too, was a more important repair base, a new hospital center, equipped to handle every sort of casualty and to do it quickly. The cheerings were welcome, and so were the recreational facilities. For Guam in 1944 was becoming what Hawaii had been two years before a place to recuperate from the last battle and to get toned up for the next one. Also, it was a place to see those wonderful USO shows.
today, the tropical shoreline is still punctuated with the wreckage of invasion craft. installations on Guam than before the war, and still molding. There is a new post office, and the old one has been converted to a public market. The Marines are quartered in Quonset barracks. Although most of the buildings are used for storage in this huge knee supply depot that covers hundreds of acres. For centuries, the islanders were Christians. Complete freedom of worship has been restored. Nineteen forty five, last year of the war. Hear this, now hear this, our objective, Iwo Jima. Direct from the Marine Corps comes this report. Early on the morning of February nineteen, the division arrived off Iwo. It was D-Day. Lying off the island was the now familiar spectacle of the vast armada of an invasion force. From every side, the guns of warships were laying down their bombardment, and overhead, wave after wave of planes hit the island. By 0815, the first three waves of assault troops were formed and waiting behind the line of departure. At 0830, they were on their way in. The weather was good, and the surf moderate. The naval gunfire, air strikes, and rocket and mortar barrages from the gunboats were saturating the beaches now, and only moderate enemy fire fell on the leading waves. As they neared the shore, the support fire moved inland in a rolling barrage. At 0902, they hit the beach, and then came trouble in large quantities. As the naval gunfire lifted, the Japanese opened up with every weapon they had. And soon, a solid sheet of fire was pouring down on the beaches and in incoming waves. Boats were hit. They broached and clogged the beaches. Vehicles ashore found the sandy volcanic ash nearly impassable. Every move was under direct observation of the Japanese on top of the cliff line and on Matsurabachi. was Iwo Jima in 1945. It was here on Blue Beach that the Marines landed. And this is how it looks today. Wreckage that was sunk in shallow water is now buried deep in the sand. The beach is still strewn with exploded shells. On Iwo, as on so many of these islands, there is a central airport. Here, only 656 miles from Tokyo, is the longest runway that we built in the Pacific. We have constructed a radio station near a wrecked five-inch gun abandoned by the enemy. This long diesel generator is the principal equipment of what GIs stationed here have impressively named Iwo Jima Power and Light, Incorporated. The GIs parade in the shadow of the enemy's natural fortress on Iwo, unchanged since the war. Mount Suribachi. It no longer seems forbidding, but if you look down from the summit, you realize with a shudder that from this commanding position, the enemy could rake the entire beach with heavy guns. It was a desperately fought battle, but we won it. And now Suribachi is just a friendly old hill, smiling down on a sunny tropical island that once was part of a Pacific battleground. Okay. 
Okinawa, April 1945. We're heading for the day. The war has been going on for nearly three and a half years and is an established routine. You could spot the real veterans because they left nothing to chance, polishing and sharpening. This was, and that means it won't be long now. Every man gets a clear idea of the terrain from those WAPs of ours. K ration or the amphibs head for the beach. Suddenly, silence. A man walks wearily along a dusty road. The battle is over. And now RGI has a new supply of reading material printed in a strange language. There's a miniature rodeo on Okinawa with Japanese Broncos. And RGI's found other things to do too. On the beach in Okinawa today is the customary debris, gradually breaking down under the attrition of wind and wave. but something new has been added. Near the wreckage of Orange Beach is a swimming pool fed by the warm tropical Pacific. Why, nowadays, there's even a library on Okinawa. And command quarters is handsomely housed. And there's a PX, clubs too, and all sorts of athletic activity. Hawaii, Midway, Wake, Guam, these are the Pacific Islands of World War II. But no more are they isolated atolls, faraway places with strange sounding names. For now, those names are forever inscribed on the pages of American history. Battlegrounds on the other side of the world. This nation will always be indebted to those who served their country on these islands as it is to those who have fought since in protection of the inalienable rights of free peoples.